Seventh-day Adventist Church right on Kohio Highway uh, down by the beach, um, uh, right in Kapa'a. And uh, we rented that facility for a couple of years, outgrew that, then moved later. But in our first year or so, uh, we had a, a problem that, was, uh, that developed in our, in our time of teaching and service. Because right about in the middle of the message, almost every week, uh, the, the Harley group that rides every week would leave from Lahui and like clockwork would end up right in the middle of my message going past uh, our church. And that was, uh, you know, if you have a couple Harleys, it's not a problem. But when you have 100 or 200 Harleys driving by, which is what they had, uh, it, it became problematic. And I remember the first time, uh, just having been to the church for, you know, maybe six months or a year or so, and, uh, and this happened for the first time, and I'm, I'm just like trying to preach through it and yell through it and everything else. And the next Sunday, I just thought, okay, I, the same thing happened. I tried to preach through it, didn't know they were coming. And then I realized, okay, they're coming every single week. And, uh, and I can't preach through that. So I, I told the church, I said, when they come through, uh, we're going to pray for them. And we're going to pray that the, that the guy that heads us up, whoever it is, that he'll come to Christ and become a part of our church. And that, uh, that there'll be a gradual influence of the kingdom of God from that point on through that person's life. And so we began to pray. And every Sunday, right in the middle of the message, uh, this thunderous roar would take place. And we would pray for like, I mean, it went on for like three, four minutes, you know. So it wasn't just like 30 seconds. I mean, it was just, they, and they went slow, you know. It's like they were in no rush. We don't have very far to go on this island, you know. If you go, the, if you go a normal speed limit, the trip is over too fast. So to stretch this out, they're going like 25 miles an hour, you know. And, uh, and so we began to pray, and week by week by week we prayed. And uh, I'm going to fast forward the story here because many of you know Russell Halawapo. Because he is the head of the Harley uh, uh, biking group here on Kauai. And, uh, and he came to Christ. And now is a fundamental part of our church. And now he's influencing, uh, along with all of us, we're doing the same things. But for, but for Russell, he's influencing the island uh, through his testimony and his service. And a man that used to be very, um, you know, just about himself, just like we all were at one time. It's now very much about the kingdom of God and about the Lord Jesus Christ and about serving other people. And so his life is actually consumed with the service of others now and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do I tell you all this? Because uh, today is Toys for Tots. And Toys for Tots is run by the Harley group on the island. And their run goes from Lahui to the North Shore uh, today. Uh, or I'm not exactly sure. I think they go there and back. But they're going to be coming by. And they're going to be, uh, they would normally go through Kapa'a town. But I talked with Russell and I said, I'd like you to make a detour and come by our church. And so they're going to be riding right through here. We're going to have to move the, no. <laughs> they're going to be, they, they normally would go right through Kapa'a. And I said, I said, Russell, bring them by the church. Just go take the bypass road because we're going to pray. And, uh, and have a little kind of a, a, a memory lane here for our church, but we also want to pray for all the other Harley riders and the bikers on this island, that God would keep them safe, that he'd bless them, that he'd take care of their families, that he would shine the light of his love and his gospel and his truth in their hearts, and that more and more of these men and women who will be riding today uh, will be touched by the life-transforming power of Christ. So I tell you all that because when it happens, you won't be able to hear me give you any instructions. <laughs> So I'm giving you the instructions now because when that group comes through, we're all just going to uh, rejoice that the leader of that, that group is a born-again, saved, spirit-filled man who's got the love of Christ just flowing out of him. And many of those other people are believers as well, but we're going to pray that God would just saturate their, their work and their effort as they uh, make this run uh, in order to give children toys this Christmas who otherwise wouldn't have that privilege so um, I'm going to count on you guys to pray, and when, when it's over, when they're done going by, we'll rejoice, and then we'll continue with wherever I am in the message. So it's going to be fun. Okay, and then I, I do want to encourage you guys to hang around for the workday, and then finally, uh, please be inviting your friends and your family and your neighbors to the events that we've got at church. You've, they, those have been announced are in the bulletin, uh, but in particular, our drive-by nativity, drive-through nativity is phenomenal. And, uh, and it's growing, and people are really enjoying it, uh, and it's, it's providing a real service in the community that is having fewer and fewer light displays and Christmas displays on the island, 
And so this becomes a chance for those of us that are older that were used to uh, experiencing something like that in the past to be able to have a venue and an avenue for introducing that kind of experience to our kids and then letting it become a part of their tradition as well. So please be inviting and thinking and praying about who you can influence for the kingdom uh, using the, um, uh, the vehicles that we've got in terms of ministry this Christmas season. Okay, so let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read the first seven verses, a prophecy about the coming of the light of the world, Jesus the Messiah. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoiced before you according to the joy of the harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the most noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be No end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Father, we want to thank you, God, that this definitive prophecy has been fulfilled. And even as we've been going over the the uh, reliability of the scriptures these last number of weeks, God. One of those aspects of evidence for its reliability is prophecy. And God, this is one of those dynamic, life-changing prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, the first coming, which has already been fulfilled. And we want to say thank you for that. We pray that you would have your way, God, that you would use this message to open our eyes to give light to our hearts, God, where there's darkness, whether it's sorrow or sadness or discouragement or being overwhelmed or depression or any other kind of uh, emotional experience that we're having. If there's darkness in our life spiritually, I pray that you would open our eyes, God, and use the word of God to shine in the dark places and bring light of your power and of your truth to our lives and our hearts this morning. And so, Father, I ask for your name to be glorified. Holy Spirit, you are the inspirer of this very word that we're teaching from, I'm teaching from this morning. And you are also the one that allows us to have eyes and ears and a mind to understand its content and application. And so we ask, God, that you would work by your power and by your love and by your grace and by your spirit this morning and teach us from your word. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I have uh, one of the ushers change the water bottle out or a Bible college student? It's going beep, 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 and it's distracting to me, so that would be really helpful. Thanks for helping me with that. So uh, this passage is about light of the world. That's the topic of uh, the message this morning. And uh, as I was thinking about that, I thought there are at least three types of darkness that we uh, are challenged with right from the get-go in life. The first is physical darkness. And, uh, and that really is terrifying. It can be quite frightening, especially uh, when we're young. It's not the opposite of light, but it's the absence of light. And uh, I'm sure all of us have times when we uh, felt darkness, where we experienced darkness, and it was frightening. And even adults, as adults, we've, we've had moments uh, where the darkness has frightened us. The second type of darkness that uh, is probably more common as we move through life is emotional darkness. And uh, it's depression and discouragement and the sense that uh, uh, the despair and hopelessness that sometimes touches our life. And I'm reminded of one of my heroes of the faith, Charles Spurgeon, who was one of the, he's called the Prince of Preachers. He's one of the greatest preachers to ever live. 
And uh, not everyone knows this, but he lived with perpetual, continual depression in his life. Uh, there was really no medication at that time. I'm not even sure there was a diagnosis for him, but he trusted God through the middle of his depression and through the middle of his hardship and the ache of his heart that was inexplicable, couldn't be touched, couldn't be, couldn't be resolved, no matter how much he followed God, no matter how much he trusted God, no matter how much confidence he had in God, he had to continue to be fruitful and trust God in the midst of that depression, which is a real great example for all of us that sometimes are touched by depression is that this man, despite that, got up every Sunday and he preached and he taught on Sunday night and he taught on Wednesday night and he had one of the largest churches in England at the time uh, and was well-known and a great author and he did all of that under the heavy blackness of depression. He called it the darkness of the soul and I think we can relate to that. And that's another type of darkness and that's a darkness that cripples. But there's a darkness that's worse, worse than than physical darkness and even worse than emotional darkness and that spiritual darkness. And Paul the Apostle talks about that when he writes uh, to the Ephesians church in chapter 2 verse 12 when he says that, that life without Christ is without hope and without God in the world. And that's true darkness. Without hope and without God in the world. And that's where a lot of people are living today. And that's the thing that I, I know for myself, and I can speak for myself, but I'm, I'm sure I can speak for you that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as well, is that as black and as dark as our environment is becoming economically, uh, politically, and otherwise, and even spiritually, as things get darker and darker, which the Bible prophesies are part of the end times events, as it gets darker and darker, we are not without hope, and we are not without God in the world. And that changes our perspective. And that light of that truth and that knowledge gives birth to hope and encouragement, even in the midst of the darkness. And the prophecies of Scripture lift us up and remind us that even these things must take place before the end comes. So I, I, I'm not a predictor of dates. Um, and I, it's, it's entirely possible I will die before the, before the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. It's possible that some of you will die before that event. It's possible that this generation will die before those events. But I don't think it's likely based on what's happening in our world. I think we're at the doorstep I think the king is coming. I think the plans are in motion. I think things are accelerating. I think that Jesus Christ is going to come back for his bride very soon. That light informs the darkness that sometimes sweeps over all of us and informs us that even these things must take place before the end. And by virtue of that spiritual understanding and the light of Christ, the spiritual darkness that we once had being unbelievers, is now filled with this incredible knowledge that God gives us through the revelation of his word. And so we have something to offer this Christmas season because uh, Christmas season is kind of like, a, it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like wrapping a present in a, in a sense. But instead of wrapping a present, Christmas kind of puts, you know, brightly colored paper and bows and ribbons around darkness. And it tries to dress it up. But underlying that, for the lives of a lot of people this Christmas season, they're still dealing with that darkness, and that's not resolved for them. And that's what we have to offer. And that's why the men in our church, and I think about Russell, and I think about so many others. I'd start going down the line, but I'd have to name so many of you. And I'd have to do the same for the women who are the light of Christ. And they are taking out that truth, not just the, the, the paper wrapping, but they've got the content of what joy means and what true light means because of the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the purpose for which this babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, that's the purpose for which he came was to be the light of the world. So I want to go through this um, uh, a, a short journey on this topic of light. And if you've got your uh, outlines in front of you, you can follow along. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. But I want to talk about the promise of God's light because this goes back to the reliability of Scripture. Because this light of the Messiah was foretold and foreshadowed and prophesied in the Old Testament, in the creation. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we have God in chapter 1 taking darkness and saying, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. And so God was the one that instituted and initiated this beauty of what's called light. 
We also have more evidence of this preparation of the Jewish people for the Messiah in the burning bush. When Moses was in the wilderness in in Exodus chapter 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to to Moses, I mean to, yes, to Moses in a flame of fire uh, from within the bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. This is called the theophany, the physical manifestation of God in some other form uh, than his true nature because he can't be seen uh, face to face and, be, and have the person that sees him live. And so he appeared to uh, Moses in a burning bush. And then we have in the pillar of fire in the book of Exodus chapter 13 that the Lord went ahead of the people of Israel in a, in a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. And he was teaching them to be dependent and how to rely on his guidance in their life. And I want to encourage you that uh, as we approach this Christmas season, the Lord is still making that available to us. And we have something far better and far uh, more intimate than a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Although that seems, wouldn't you like to have that sometime? It's like, which way should I go? And the, the pillar of fire goes that way. Which car should I buy? And the pillar of fire just lands right on top of the car. Which of the five women should I marry? Or the ten men should I marry? And it's like, you know, it's like, okay, it's so easy. But I want to tell you something, that the Lord has provided something far greater than a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud. And that's the intimacy of the Holy Spirit living in us, speaking to us and teaching us to recognize his voice and understand his will and his guidance for us. He's given us his word as well. But this light was given to the, to the nation of Israel so that they could know and be trained to have intimacy with God. And then, of course, the, the culmination of that light was in the Shekinah glory of the temple uh, that was the visible manifestation of the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the temple of God. And the Shekinah glory was so bright and so powerful that there were frequently times when, when the priests couldn't even go in because it was so blinding and so overpowering and so overwhelming. And God took up presence, up, up physical residence in the presence of men and women in this manifestation, again, a, a theophany, the physical manifestation of God in the form of this radiant light. And again, I, I can't help but think about the, the gift that we've got, something far greater than the Shekinah glory of God is the indwelling presence of the seal of the Holy Spirit because they had to go to a temple and they couldn't even go in. It was the, it was the high priest once a year that had access to that intimacy. But for us as believers, we don't have to go to a place. We don't, have, we don't even have to come to church. We, we don't have to be anywhere special. We can be in some very difficult times. We can be at the, you know, we could be enjoying ourselves at the beach you know, we can be on the mainland. We can be far away uh, struggling with uh, uh, the death of a loved one. Uh, we can be almost anywhere. We can be anywhere and have immediate access to intimacy with the Holy Spirit because now God doesn't take up residence in, in buildings of stone and brick and mortar or canvas, but he takes up residence in the hearts of those that call on his name, the light of Christ indwelling the hearts of men and women who have become followers of Jesus Christ. All of this was foretold by the prophets, of course, from this passage that we're looking at, that, that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned, and that light prophetically referring to Jesus Christ. Of course, all this was fulfilled in him. He says in John 1 that he offered light to every man. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He declared himself to be light in John 8. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I don't think we can fully appreciate light until we've dealt with darkness. Until we've really come to grips with darkness, I don't think we can really appreciate light. I don't think until you've you know, really dealt with depression in your life, uh, can you really appreciate how despairing depression is? We have quite a few people every year on Kauai that kill themselves. We have kind of a, a, a plague of that with our young people on the island, uh, mostly by hanging here. And I know this isn't unique to Kauai, but we have, a, we have a problem with that here. Probably some of you visiting from other areas of the country have problems with that as well. Why would a young person with so much ahead of them take their life? 
Well, because they've experienced and come face to face with a darkness that's so black that they can't envision going on any longer. And some of you here struggle with that. I think we all have moments like that, but some of you struggle with that on a regular basis. And you're like Charles Spurgeon, and you're having to learn how to live in faith and confidence in God despite the blackness of the soul and the darkness of the heart. If you haven't been through a divorce or you haven't suffered the loss of a spouse or a child or if you haven't been chronically ill or dealt with someone that was chronically ill, if you haven't suffered a financial catastrophe or a bankruptcy or the embarrassment of some public exposure, I'm not sure that you can fully appreciate how wonderful light is, but when you come to grips with these things, Light is a thing of beauty. Light's really meaningful. And that certainly has to be said to be true about those that come to grips with spiritual darkness. In fact, that's one of the things that's really essential to come to Christ in the first place, is we have to say, I am in darkness. (laughs) I am participating in darkness. I've got to confess that I am walking in darkness, and I want to repent of my darkness, and I want to come to the light That's what the Christian life is about. It's a renouncing of the darkness and embracing of the light of Christ. So what's the purpose of this light that God has given us in Christ? Well, it's to reveal the truth about God. Uh, John 1, 18 says that no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is by the Father's side, has made him known. It's a reference to Jesus Christ. He is the light. He reveals the light. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he's been given authority to bring light to mankind to deal with the difficulties of darkness. Uh, You know, if if we hadn't had the light of this book and the light of the revelation through the prophets, we would probably have a very twisted and perverted view of God, much like the Greeks, much like the pagan deities of the past and the present. We would have a very strange view of God that's, that's informed by our twisted, broken, dark thinking because we would think that God is somehow like us and by virtue of being like us, we would form a theology that's based on things that make sense to us. And it would, here they come. Okay, hold that thought. Let's enjoy this. That's Russell, a born-again believer, carrying the light of Christ, leading the way. Let's pray for all these guys. Thank you, Lord. Oh, they're being so quiet. Just go ahead and pray. You can even pray out loud if you want to. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for these guys. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for these men and women. Every one of these bikes with riders going past our church, Lord, belongs to you. They were made in your image. They were designed by you to have relationship with you. God, they've got families and they've worked hard on this island. They've made investments here in this, in this culture and in this place. They are doctors and nurses and school teachers. They're, they're people that work in our government. They're police officers. They are firemen. They are people that work in our service industries and the hotel industry. And God, we're asking that you would Bless those that know you and those that have yet to know you, God. I pray that you'd bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that the man leading the way and many others are born again. And so, Father, I just, I rejoice. My heart is just so full when I think about what you've done and how you've answered prayer. And I pray that you'd continue to answer as we seek your face and as many others are praying and asking God that you would touch not just the bikers on this island, but every man and every woman and every young person with the gospel of Jesus Christ this Christmas season. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I just am so, I'm so filled with joy. Um, the only thing I wish we could have done, and it wouldn't have really worked because it's not tenable, but ne- I'm thinking next year we should be right at our gate, you know, <laughs> waving as they go by. Okay. Okay, so let's see. I've got to get myself back into connection here. Okay, yeah, so our, our understanding of light would have been completely skewed without the revelation of God. So one of the major purposes was to reveal the truth. 
but it was also to reveal our, our dark condition. Listen to what Psalm 107 says about what life is like apart from God. Some sat in darkness and in the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in, chi- in chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. This is a life, uh, this is a description of a life apart from Christ. And, and there's a darkness. It's not just an emotional darkness. It's not just a physical darkness, but it's the worst of all darknesses, and that's the spiritual darkness. It's a separation from God for which God has provided an avenue for an arising of the shining of the light because it's come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. That's God's plan. And it's to reveal the way back to God. I like what Jesus says in John 12, 46. He says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. But we have a choice. I, I just want to encourage you too that even those of us that are believers, we, we have to choose daily. I have to choose daily. I have to walk away from darkness. I, I'm tempted to do things that are not, not right or honoring to God. I'm tempted to have thoughts or to sit on thinking that's not really of the Lord. And I have to make a willful choice. I have to take my thoughts captive, as it talks about in 2 Corinthians 10.5, and I have to make them obedient to Christ. And so I have to, I have to willfully decide every single day. So if some of you somehow think that that walking with Christ is a piece of cake, and some, I, I, they, they seem to do it so easily and so effortlessly. All I can tell you is that's not true. It's a daily decision. As Paul said, every day, day I have to die daily to myself. And so there's this commitment that we've got to not stay in the darkness. So if you found yourself in darkness this Christmas season, for whatever reason, I, I'm calling you, I'm exhorting you, I'm encouraging you to step aside and out of darkness and to step into the light of Christ by repenting of sin and being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know what's shocking is that despite God's plan that every man and every woman would have light in their life, that every man and woman would be uh, stepping out of darkness, that every man and woman and young person would be free from the bondage that comes from being in darkness, there are many that will not choose that, that lifestyle. They won't choose that life. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's confusing because many will reject the light because they prefer the darkness. And I want to talk about this just for a minute and the application of it because we're all terribly confused as Christians about what's happening in our culture, in our politics, and spiritually in the world right now. Because what we're doing is that we're bringing our, our pattern of thinking and our understanding of right and wrong and morality and goodness and light and God and truth and all these things. We're bringing that screen to our understanding of the events that are taking place around us, say, for instance, with ISIS, or for instance, with some of the decisions our government is making about protecting our country or whatever it might be. And we're we're filtering everything that's happening outside of us that we don't have control over, and we're saying, this doesn't make any sense. Don't you feel that way? Don't you feel like, what what are people thinking? I mean, that's what I'm hearing more and more is like, This is just insane. How could we find ourselves in such a place as we are now in such a short period of time so far removed from the foundation of this book to the point that now not only this book but the teaching of this book is now already in some states being challenged as whether it's even appropriate to teach from. That's taking place now. These things are being challenged in court court, uh, documents and in lawsuits. And we can't pray. There are certain things that we can't even talk about anymore. Uh, There are certain topics that we can't address that are moral issues in our country. If you put these things on Facebook and you're too vocal, you will be removed from Facebook. If you say these things vocally uh, in in a public domain, in a public area, uh, you are at risk for being uh, labeled all kinds of things and even possibly sanctioned in some way by our government. It's increasing, and it's going to get worse. And we're having trouble making sense of it, aren't we? Am I the only one? Aren't you guys having trouble making sense of it? And we're like, why, why, what are people thinking? Right? Isn't that what it is? You know, the Bible has a very clear reason, and it's so simple and it's so uncomplicated, it's going to blow your mind. This is, this is why there is such a disconnect. And it comes all the way down to this fundamental issue of light. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. The words of Jesus. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light 
and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So it tells us two things. Is that people that do evil don't like light. And people that do evil are in fear of the light because if light comes, their deeds will be exposed. This is why there's such a disconnect. Because it doesn't make sense until you understand that there is an aversion to light that's at stake here. And it's the light of Christ, ultimately. Now, we can filter this down and talk about morals and ethics and economics and everything else. But ultimately, the truth is found in this, which teaches us about the true light of of the world, which is Jesus Christ. And you can mention any name, any religion, uh, any philosophy, except Christianity, and you'll be embraced and loved, and you'll have all kinds of rights and privileges. But these particular rights and privileges are closing and closing quickly on one group of people, and those are followers of Jesus Christ. So this is the, this is the challenge that we face. This is the, the disconnect that we struggle with. Why? 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 And Jesus answers it very clearly here. It's because some love darkness. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you uh, have your arguments online with your Facebook friends and tell them they're sons of darkness and uh, ha- use that as a witnessing technique. But I'm just saying that this is what we're dealing with ultimately. This is a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms. If we fight this with carnal weapons, with just simply our words, or with simply our, our positions, or our platform, or our logic, we will fight a losing battle. This is a battle that has to do with the light and darkness of the heavenly realms that are at stake. The Bible tells us that the light will overcome victoriously. That's going to happen. But in the meantime, we're not there yet. That victory is not yet inaugurated. It will come. But for now, like Jesus said in the parable of the tares and the wheat, we've got both of these things growing up at the same time, sometimes even in the church itself. And he says in the midst of that, we've got to be prepared to walk sometimes in the middle of a very dark world while we continue to hold forth the word of truth and the word of light. And what's at stake and why there is such an aversion to the light is because people that do wrong, people that do evil, and I hate to say it, but this even happens among Christendom, where men and women that are followers of Jesus Christ, who are believers, who even teach the Bible, would rather walk in darkness than follow this book because their deeds are evil. And if they follow this book in the leadership and in the oversight of his church, then this book must also mandate and correct and bring exhortation to their own lives. And because of that, many now, even in the church, are very slow to act on what the Bible says in terms of governing the bride of Christ, which is God's church. It's his bride. It's his property. And so our job as a church is to walk in the light no matter what the cost is so that the bride can be pure and the purposes of God can be sustained and so that the testimony of the saints is unblemished in the community and in the world. And so these are the reasons that God has given us this light And this is the reason why many prefer darkness. They're also spiritually blind. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 that the God of this age has blinded unbelievers um, so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there's there's a blindness that Satan brings in. We need to pray against that as we're witnessing to our friends. Certainly use apologetics. Certainly use all the tools at hand. But don't neglect prayer because ultimately if a person's mind is darkened by the enemy, they need to be delivered from that. And that's a spiritual event. And of course, when a person rejects the light, the Bible tells us that they they attempt to create their own light. This is a great passage in, in Isaiah chapter 50. I encourage you to read this on your own sometime. But this is what it says. He says, Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. It's a call to salvation in the book of Isaiah. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches... Go, walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. 
this is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. And what the prophet is basically saying is that God is providing light, but he is the source and the originator of light. We need to come to him, forsake the darkness, come to him as the source of light and walk in the light. And the only other option for people that reject Jesus and the teachings of Scripture is that they've got to create their own light. And, and there's a thousand ways that people do this. They do it through success. They do it through marriage. They do it through uh, having offspring. They do it through hobbies and activities, through trying to protect themselves and, and uh, insulate themselves financially. There's so many ways that people try to, you know, to, to get a torch going in their own life. Some people use drugs and addictions. There's, a, there's just a thousand different things that people do to somehow manage to squeak out some little measure of light in their life when all the while the Shekinah glory of God is available to every man and woman if they should choose to receive that light. On the other hand, in contrast to those that reject the light, we have those who embrace the light. They choose the light. The Bible tells us in, in John that he came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They walk in the light of Christ. This is what John, 1 John says in chapter 1. This is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So, it's not just an issue that we need to come to the light to be saved, but the Bible says that if we truly are saved, we're going to stay in the light. So the idea that is being embraced by the church, unfortunately, today, is that it doesn't matter how we live as long as we believed correctly. So if we think and believe correctly, how we live doesn't make any difference. And I've shared this before, but that is modern-day Gnosticism, and it's a cult, and it's a pagan philosophy that separated the body from the spirit in philosophy, and it's a Greek philosophy, and it was imported into the early church, which is why 1 John was written to combat that. In fact, many of the uh, uh, early epistles were written to combat Gnosticism, and what it means is a higher knowledge or wisdom, gnosis, knowledge. And what they, what they taught was that the body is evil, the spirit is good. Whatever you do with the body is so corrupt it can never be redeemed and it has no impact whatsoever on your spirit. So you can worship God in your spirit and live immorally in an ungodly life, be a devious, deceptive, ungodly man or woman, and have no problem worshiping God with an absolutely clear conscience because God is a forgiving God and God will not judge our sins no matter what we do. And friends, that's modern day Gnosticism. Because the Bible teaches no such thing. What the Bible teaches is that if we have the light of Christ, we will walk in the light of Christ. If we walk in the light of Christ, that means we're leaving darkness behind. So if we fool ourselves, as it talks about in 1 John extensively, that we know God but don't obey God or walk with God or walk in the light, the Bible says we're a liar and the truth isn't in us. It's a deception. And so the person that actually has embraced the light, they not only choose the light, but they walk in the light of Christ, and go, they go farther than that because they spread this light. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The fruit of God's light is amazing, and I'm just going to let you look up these verses on your own. I'm just going to, if you're filling this out, you're going to have to fill this out very quickly. These are the fruits of walking in the light. Number one, you have life. That's just huge. Eternal life. You have peace with God because the man of peace has come. You have joy. You have confidence before God because the fruit of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness will be quiet and confidence forevermore. You'll have rest because Jesus said that he came to give us rest for our weary souls. We're talking about the men and the women. When I thought that was funny about Alex. Hey, we're tired too. Um, yeah, we are kind of tired sometimes. Um, but, but the Lord promises that we, we can have rest. He assures us of rest that comes when we follow him, even in the midst of all the work. And we have purpose because he's made us to be a covenant for the 
for the Gentiles and a light, even as he did with the people of Israel. Now he sends us as well as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. So here's the conclusion of this message. There are three types of darkness that, that we're dealing with. We're dealing with physical darkness and emotional darkness and spiritual darkness. And God resolves every single one of these things in the power of the coming of Jesus Christ. Because when Christ comes and establishes his new kingdom, this is what the Bible says that kingdom will be like. First of all, physical darkness will be a thing of the past. Listen to Revelation 21. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. So the physical darkness, which is really the least of our concerns, especially as adults, is a, is a resolved issue in the kingdom of heaven. How about emotional darkness? I mean, I don't want a raise of hands, but I'll raise my hand. I will be so happy when I don't have to deal with depression anymore, when I never get anxious anymore, when I never wake up with a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach because of something I've got to address or deal with, you know, when I don't have a bad dream in the middle of the night. I had one last night, and it was just like it was really... I didn't sleep well. I woke up at like, I, this is awful. I, got, I woke up at 8 o'clock this morning. So shaming. Because I woke up like three times in the night and I just slept right through my alarm and everything. And so I woke up at 8 o'clock because of this emotional darkness that, that swept over me last night. And I will be so, won't you be glad when that's over? Can you imagine life without that? What would life be like when you could never have a bad emotion again? Where it just, that's just a, a thing of the past. Well, listen to what the Bible says in Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear away from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And so emotional darkness will be a thing of the past. What about spiritual darkness? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. That full light of day is coming. It's not here yet, but as Christians, we are walking more and more in the light, and by virtue of that, we are experiencing more light, and by virtue of that, the dawning of the day of Christ is taking place in our lives now, even before he comes, when that full dawn will finally take place and this battle and this spiritual warfare and our mission will be completed. But until he comes, that mission continues. And until he comes, we will have this struggle of darkness in our life and challenge. And we will be dealing with people who have not stepped out of the darkness for a very simple, uncomplicated reason. They'll give you a thousand reasons why they think their positions are right. They'll give you a thousand reasons why, you th why they think Christianity uh, is, uh, should be in the dustbin of, of human history. All these things will, will take place, but the Bible confirms it to us again and again. They reject it because their ways are evil. And the exposure of their evil ways is something they don't want. Do you understand why even in politics... It's hard to find good and clean and honorable and noble and ethical and moral politicians. Do you understand why? Because those kind can't survive in the midst of evil because evil sanctions goodness and gives no room for goodness. And that's why we are in such desperate straits in our political arena in our country is because even good men get pulled in and pulled down because that's what's required to survive and succeed. And I'm not saying that's exclusively true. We need to continue to pray. We've got a lot of Christian and godly men and women in politics, but you can understand the uphill struggle they're facing in a world of corruption. And of course, all these people that have been corrupt, whoever they may be at whatever level, it's not just politics, it's in our, it's in our country, it's in our leadership, it's in our homes, it's sometimes even in the church, when we have that kind of a situation, the people who are doing evil are going to do everything they can to keep their evil deeds hidden from sight. And for that to happen, 
the light cannot shine, and those that shine the light are rejected. So, as Peter, as uh, Paul told Timothy, anyone who wants to live a godly life, walking in the light, will suffer persecution. We've got to embrace it. We've got to accept it and be blessed by it. That as time goes on, and as the stakes are raised, the price will increase for those of us that call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And rather than being shocked and surprised and disillusioned because our frame of reference doesn't make any sense of what people are doing, we need to embrace what the Bible actually says about the true Christian life and understand that, that we need to put our trust in God. And no matter what, we need to stand for the King of Kings and for the light of the world because he will reward those that don't shrink back in these last days. So I want to encourage you. We've got, we've got an incredible message. We've got an incredible God. And we've got an incredible Savior. And everything is aggressively moving forward toward this final conclusion. Be found walking in the light. Father, thank you for this time this morning and for your word. And just pray that you'd bless uh, the teaching and the scriptures that were shared. I pray that that all of us, myself included, would be inspired and encouraged and, and uh, at peace more than ever before, recognizing that these things are told to us in Scripture and the answers are very, very simple and uncomplicated. But that simple and uncomplicated explanation includes an understanding of good and evil which our world doesn't recognize because they don't recognize you. I pray that you would encourage us and rather than us you know holding ground and just trying to survive this time lord i pray that we would shine the light of christ wherever we go that we would be the light of christ that we would be free of fear and anxiety and darkness i pray that you'd lift the the heaviness of depression from anyone here today that's struggling god i pray that you would wipe it away as they put their trust in you and god if it's necessary then give us the power and the strength of godly men like like Charles Spurgeon, that was able to continue to do the work of the Lord despite the blackness of the soul that he suffered with morning, noon, and night every day of his life, and yet was one of the most fruitful, one of the most evangelistic, one of the most faithful servants that the world has ever known. God, make us faithful. Teach us to walk in the light. And God, help us to embrace your coming. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just uh, close by saying that uh, we're going to you can go ahead and stand up. We're going to close our service with a last worship song. I, I just kind of feel led to, to do this. If, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ as your Savior, I would highly recommend as the Christmas season approaches that you make that decision today and that you admit your need, repent of your sin, be willing to walk in the light, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, and that there is no other way to come to Christ and be saved and forgiven of sins except through Christ and then to confess him as Lord, which is, means that you, you are no longer in charge of your life, but you are giving him the lordship of your life. If you want to make that decision today, I want you to come up here. Can some of the leaders of the church be up here after the service? And, and anyone else that would like to come up who's depressed and struggling with depression, I, I want you to come up this morning, and we want to pray over you and ask that God would fill you with his hope and his encouragement and his power to either have that that depression lift off of you or to give you the power and the strength and the favor of God to be able to endure it until it does lift. So if you want prayer for those things, then I encourage you to come up. Otherwise, uh, enjoy this, um, what we've got coming up after, uh, after the service in this fundraiser. Please join us to help set, do these sets. If you need to go home and change and get some other clothes, then feel free.